police states, like Brazil and the Soviet Union, they have a vague law which the authorities use to silence and imprison people with certain political and moral views. You may be surprised to know that we have begun to use almost exactly the same kind of law in Britain. The law is conspiracy. Now before you say, oh come on, British justice would never allow anything like that, please look at this film. The evidence that will follow will show that a law made before the Middle Ages and never sanctioned by Parliament has been dug up quite recently to be used virtually unchanged as a tool of suppression. Let's be quite clear, this law can affect us all. To be charged with conspiracy you need not have committed any crime or have even been associated with a crime. Indeed it's likely that all you will have done is committed or thought of committing a trivial civil wrong like trespassing. But if there are more than two of you, the trivial offence of trespassing, which is not a criminal offence, can suddenly become conspiracy, for which you can get a huge fine and up to life imprisonment. And at your trial, you can be convicted on rumours, on who you are, on how you live, on what your friends are. Conspiracy, an English judge said recently, can amount to a nod and a wink. A nod and a wink, that is a mere cursory agreement, can find you convicted of the serious crime of conspiracy and imprisoned for years. It doesn't matter if the agreement is not serious, and it doesn't matter that what you agreed to do is not itself a crime, like trespassing. The publicity over the demonstrations by Peter Hayne obscured a dramatic change in the use of English law. In 1969, the archaic laws of conspiracy were dug up to use against Hayne in his campaign to draw public attention to racialism in South African sport. At this Davis Cup match in Bristol, Hayne made his point peacefully. Play was interrupted for only 10 to 15 minutes, and if the sporting authorities had wanted to sue Hayne for the civil wrong of trespass, they had a perfect right to do so. But what Hayne actually did had absolutely nothing to do with the police charge or with the criminal courts. But much later, he was to find himself accused as a dangerous conspirator. Why was a conspiracy charge chosen for you in the first place. I think there was because an interesting was, history to that, isn't it? Yes, because it was the only way that they could prosecute yes. me, basically. Uh, they could not prove that I'd done anything in terms of a substantive offence that was illegal. Take, for example, the tennis match, which I was finally convicted over in this Old Bailey trial. It took place in July 1969. Four of us ran on to a Davis Cup tennis match and sat down on the field. We were cleared off by police. It was fairly friendly and certainly peaceful. The police never charged us. Yet, three years later, I was found guilty of conspiring to trespass upon that um, tennis court and was given a £200 pound fine and, and found guilty. Um, they would not have been able to get me on trespass on its own without sticking conspiracy in front of it because trespass is a civil offence and it would have required the owners of the ground to bring charges for damage against me, to sue me for damages. Since there wasn't any damage, nothing could have been done about it. What do you think your trial proved, Peter? Well, it's proved a number of things. The, it showed people that there isn't really a right to demonstrate in Britain. This was said by a claim by the prosecuting mm -hmm. counsel, Owen Stable, when he opened the case against me. He said this trial will prove that there isn't a right to demonstrate, and I think he, he showed that at the end of it. During the Hayne demonstrations, a retired judge, Sir Hugh Stable, wrote to the Daily Telegraph urging that Hayne be prosecuted with conspiracy to trespass. Sir Hugh omitted to mention that he himself had set a long-forgotten precedent in 1946 by finding a man guilty of conspiring to house homeless ex-servicemen in disused army shelters. In this way, the reintroduction of the conspiracy laws came about almost by accident. A barrister called Francis Benyon, supported by South African interests, duly complied with a judge's suggestion and briefed none other than the judge's own son, Mr Owen Stable, QC, to bring Hain to justice as a conspirator. Direct action protest, yeah. the idea of the sit-in, mm. the obstructive protest rather than the symbolic one, has um, aroused tremendous hostility in official circles naturally because I think there's an unspoken motto in the establishment that you can protest all you like, chaps, as long mm. as you're ineffective. Yes. Direct action is effective, and so an all-embracing catch-all charge like mm. conspiracy is the only way of stopping it. Yes. For myself, I most certainly do, when I'm thinking of protesting or taking direct action, do constantly think of 
the conspiracy implications. And I, d I don't think there's any doubt that it's had a restraining effect on my colleagues and other people involved in the field. Because, you see, it's not something that a, a charge that can be brought for what people would regard as nasty things like blowing up buildings or um, violence. I could have been given life imprisonment for conspiring to shout an insulting slogan because there's no um, limit on the sentence that a conspiracy charge can result in. In the 19th century, the conspiracy laws were used to intimidate workers in their attempts to secure decent conditions. In 1973, Shrewsbury building workers campaigned against the notorious lump, the use of non-union labour and its acceptance of dangerous work conditions. At the trial of the Shrewsbury pickets, who were charged with conspiracy to intimidate, the judge said, you know very well it can be a conspiracy when they never met and they never knew each other. Actually, I'd never heard of conspiracy and I don't think any of the others, the other six had ever heard of conspiracy. Was it ever really, did it ever really become clear to you what it meant? No. What? Not really, no. Right through the trial? No. I don't think it was clear to anybody, even the jury didn't understand the meaning of conspiracy. I mean, what did you think was happening? I mean, you, you had this terribly serious charge with, with well, life imprisonment uh, maximum at the end of it. Yeah. I mean, what, what... Our view was that it was something that was um, sort of brought up on the spur of the moment to try and deter the working class people from getting a decent living in decent conditions. Has there been any kind of protest at all since the trial? Any picketing? Um, no, I don't, not, in, not in my area anyway. There hasn't been any um, yeah. strikes or union action at all since the yes. trial itself. Yes. And the picketing fundamentally was about safety regulations. This, the main about thing the about the general, strike but was, yes. Yeah. Now, that, now that the conspiracy law has been used against um, union members and union leaders, nobody wants to be a leader, nobody wants to be in the union, therefore the, the safety regulations on building sites are now deteriorating very badly. The development is wholly a common law one. It's been in the hands of the prosecutors who have used it in all kinds of ways and have developed it over the last 10, 20 years. And the courts have provided very little curb upon this kind of development. I think that's the undesirable side of it. Primarily, we don't know the full extent of it, although we're beginning to feel the impact of the full extent of it. When you say we haven't, we haven't yet felt the full impact of them, what do you mean by that? Well, I think uh, uh, one's got to be careful about talking about cases which have not yet been tried, but mm. I think there are cases which are coming up into the courts in the near future, mm. which are beginning to show how prosecutors are using the conspiracy count for new areas mm. of activity, and very much more in the area which you would regard in your terminology as being political. Mm. Industrial relations is an area in which I think we may very well see further use of the conspiracy count. We've seen a little bit of it in connection with the Shrewsbury pickets. Mm. Um, more of that sort of thing, you think? I, I think there's a very great danger that we may see more of that sort of thing, particularly if the economic crisis gets worse and the people out of work. And I think there may be a great deal more industrial unrest in which uh, mm. uh, the authorities may very well seek to use the conspiracy count in order to control the situation. It's being used for all kinds of activity, which by no stretch of the imagination could be said to be uh, uh, designed to overthrow the government, uh, mm. but simply in some way or other uh, is unacceptable behavior in terms of uh, public order or social order, the area of morals and the film censorship, all, all the areas of censorship, for example, and free speech. In recent years, Lord Longford has led a small and stridently moralising pressure group and with Mary Whitehouse has campaigned for one moral code for the entire community. Their campaign has succeeded in contributing to a certain moral climate among the police, the media and the judiciary. And an indirect result has been the establishment's use of the conspiracy weapon against people whom they can't convict under the obscenity laws. Now this magazine, His and Hers, which is a contact magazine, was the subject of a case brought under the Obscene Publications Act and an obscene charge, as it were, was dismissed against this magazine completely in March 71. That's correct. Uh, the obscenity charge was dismissed, uh, dismissed in 1971 and because it had been found not guilty in mm. the court, I assumed that it was perfectly legal for me to sell the magazine. So at this stage, where and I took on the distribution in June. Yeah. So you're dealing with a, with a magazine, a perfectly legal magazine. In fact, one that had been 
washed clean, as it were, by the courts uh, yes. a long time before. Yes. yes. My client ran a wholesale newspaper business. He had told me, or told my firm, that this magazine had been cleared and had asked our advice before taking on the distributorship of this magazine whether it was proper for him to do so. And we said, yes, provided you it's all tied up legally, a proper agreement with the publishers, there was no reason why you shouldn't uh, include this magazine as one of your magazines in a normal course of business. There seemed to be nothing wrong with it. What is your view of, of conspiracy charges like this? Conspiracy, when it's used in this form, I personally feel it's used for the wrong reasons. It was used, perhaps, as a political end. Pressure had been put on Parliament, as I think I've said before, and Parliament wasn't going to pass any legislation to deal with obscenity, or any further legislation to deal with obscenity, or anything to do with public morals. So the only way that the Crown or the prosecution could have dealt with this sort of offence was by means of a conspiracy charge. And in this case, they, in my view, failed miserably. What is really wrong with the conspiracy laws as they stand now? I think one of the major defects is uh, the position of those who are not the central players in the particular criminal activity. That is to say, those who are uh, the fringe actors. What happens in conspiracy cases is that the that terribly dangerous concept of guilt by association so easily gets translated into uh, a conspiracy. Mm. And it's very difficult in the great mass of material which is often uh, brought into the courtroom by way of evidence. Large amounts of it, not directed to any particular individual, but all of them who stand in the dark get smeared by it and get, as it were, engulfed by it. And at the end of the day, uh, a jury finds it difficult to discriminate between the various actors and the, the actual parts they play in it and simply lump them all together and say, well, they're, they're all in it and they all get uh, uh, convicted together. And I think this is one of the really great dangers of conspiracy. In June 1973, nine members of the Welsh Language Society arrived in London intending to occupy a BBC office in Portland Place as a peaceful protest against what they regarded as a small number of programmes produced in Welsh by the BBC. But they didn't get very far. They were arrested in a car park and kept in cells at Marylebone Police Station for two nights without being charged. It was supposed to be a demonstration against the BBC as part of the Welsh Language Society's yes. campaign to get a Welsh television channel for Wales. I see, yes. And the BBC was the establishment and... You know, yes. It's going only to talk and demonstration. Yes. So you, well, what, what had you intended to do, in fact, I mean? To disarrange files and yes. empty cupboards. And to sit in overnight? Yes, and just in one room. I see. So let me get this clear. What you were intending to do is to go into the BBC, go into a room, rearrange some yes. files. Yes, yes. Uh, the point of the files being what? Just, no, it just was to, just to cause inconvenience, that's all. I see, all. yes. Uh, and then to leave uh, peacefully. You, you hadn't intended to... No, we, we, no we were going to stay until, we, you know, the people came in the following morning and be yes. arrested. So, when you were taken to, 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 taken to, uh, to the police station, you were held for how long? For, I think, uh, from late Tuesday night till Thursday morning when we appeared in court. Now, but when... But you weren't charged with conspiracy then, though, no. were you? What were you charged with then? Um, being equipped to cause cr criminal damage, I think. Being equipped to cause criminal yes. damage? Mm -hmm. Yes. What did you have? What equipment did you uh, have? A uh, roll of sellotape and two glass cutters between nine people. I see, and that was the basis of the charge to cause yes, criminal yes, damage? Yes, yes. Right, now when were, you, when were you charged with conspiracy? When did that first come up? Oh, about six months afterwards, I think. And, you know, the charge was just being kept... Didn't kept we were coming yeah. up to London every two months and just come back in another two months all the time. Mm. But didn't you have, did you have any intimation at all that you would be charged with no, conspiracy? No, no, yeah. it came as a shock to... It yeah. just appeared yeah, out of the yes, blue six yes, months later? Yes. I think they didn't have sufficient evidence against us, you know, well, they, for they, any of the charge. So when you were charged with conspiracy, how long after that was, uh, was your trial? Well, the whole thing lasted a year, from June 71 to 
no, 72, 73. It lasted a year from yes, the time yes. you were picked up we, here we, to your trial. Yes, yes. And how long did your trial last? Two days, or one and a half days. A year and then two yes, days? Yes, Why only two days if there well, was a year of inquiries? Well, they had, you know, just no evidence. Well, uh, can you describe what happened? What, what did, the, what did well, the judge say? What was the... Well, we went to court and um, Minir and I didn't stay in the the court for the hearing because you know it's a political trial we didn't yes. want any part of it so we kept taken down to the cells but there's just no evidence against us you know two glass cutters and this real cell said don't make conspiracy real. on april the 20th this year 21 iranians living in london went to the iranian embassy to protest against the murder and torture of political prisoners in their country they were allowed into the embassy they sat down and ten minutes later they were asked by police to leave and they left peacefully. The resulting publicity was one of the few reminders that Britain is deeply in pawn to the oil-rich Shah of Persia, a strutting Mussolini-style dictator who runs one of the most effective police states in the world and on the admission of his own regime has a habit of torturing and shooting those who oppose him. The 21 Iranians who sat down at the embassy in London were charged with the serious crime of conspiracy to trespass. Dr. Brennan, could you tell me what happened after you were arrested? Um, actually, uh, we were evicted uh, from the Iranian embassy to the Jaro police station. And uh, in the beginning, uh, we have been told it's not a serious case. Uh, but uh, after nearly 30 hours, we were, dis we were charged Who told with you conspiracy, uh, with trespass. Who told you it wasn't a serious case? Um, one of the police officers. One of the police officers. Yes. Do you remember what he said? Uh, actually, I can't remember, you know, the exact, mm -hmm. you know, the sentence. But uh, as he said, it's not, uh, it's not an important case, and it takes only a few hours to check your position through the immigration office. And uh, this is the only thing that you know we have been told in the beginning. Yes. But uh, nearly 30 hours after war, yes. we were dis we were charged with conspiracy to trespass. Yes, Mr. Simons, you're representing Dr. Bredin. Yes. Could you tell us something <coughs> about the the kind of law under which he's been charged and well, what it means? He's been charged with conspiracy to trespass. And trespass itself in English law isn't an offence. It's purely a, a civil a tort. And unusually, um, the House of Lords two years ago said that conspiracy to trespass, i.e. conspiracy, a, an agreement to commit a civil tort, can be and is an offence. And since then, the charge has been widely used against demonstrators, against other people who have occupied embassies. Um, I think it's only been used in a political context. Yes. At dawn one morning last October, the special branch raided the London offices of Peace News. They found a pile of leaflets and a member of the staff, John Hyatt, asleep. The leaflets belonged to the British withdrawal from Northern Ireland campaign and Hyatt was arrested and eventually charged, along with 13 others, with conspiracy to incite disaffection among soldiers. Their trial is next month. Quite a large number of people are, are getting so angry with, with the way the law is being used in relationship to our own particular cases. It's, it's interesting that since the prosecutions were brought, um, the amount of leafleting of, of British soldiers in, and barracks has in fact increased. And not only has it increased, but people who traditionally have been very reluctant to, to lay themselves on the line, um, thinking of people in, in the professions and so on, um, seem to have been prepared to, to carry out actions out of a realization that, that the law cannot totally be fought in, in the court. On May the 29th this year, The Guardian published this letter signed by 10 prominent citizens including a professor of law, an army brigadier, and Monsignor Bruce Kent. They announced their intention to hand copies of the same leaflet in the Peace News case to soldiers at the army recruiting office in Bradford. Their purpose was to demonstrate their support for the 14 charge and for freedom of speech. On May the 29th, they went to the recruiting office and did as the 14 charged are accused of doing. And on July the 15th, the chief superintendent of West Yorkshire Police wrote to Monsignor Kent and said that in their case the police intended to take no further action. Why was their case so different? Why weren't they charged like the others? Are the conspiracy laws reserved for certain groups only? 
I think basically because they have no respectable lobby behind them in the way that we have. Um, if they take in a couple of professors, then they're going to have a split in Bradford University. If they take me in, they're going to have the churches. If they take in David Harding, the same. And I think it's uh, this very middle class and the proper sort of group that back us up or would do if they knew the issues and uh, realized what was going on. When they realize that it's nothing, nothing to do with Northern Ireland, I think that's uh, red herring to go out of the way. Uh, then I think we are really a threat, more of a threat than the Hyatts of this world, because mm. um, of the people who would be looking mm. to the things we're doing. Why do you think conspiracy is being used in this? Why aren't people simply charged with contravening the Act? Well, I'm afraid I think it's because it's a, it's a sort of sloppy legislation. You don't have to prove very much, um, and so it's easy to do. And uh, secondly, I think, because the sentences can be colossal, and um, they have been colossal in the past for, for offences, committed. And so um, I think in two ways, I think it's bad law. It's mm -hmm. just too open. And as we know, I mean, I'm sure you know from the other, other, other examples that you'll be showing on this program, I don't doubt, that it is hitting at all sorts of people, and really especially people who are not really able to defend themselves very well. There's not going to be public sympathy for the 14. It, in a way, it's too muddled up with Northern Ireland. Uh, they'll be thought the people, to be... The people who were charged mm. for the same offence that same you offense. weren't charged yeah. for. I yes. mean, they're, in a sense, from the respectable area of society, they're fringe people. I mean, I'm not saying this in an elite way, because I know uh, that they're very important people, but they won't count a great deal, and so conspiracy, well, no one's going to make a fuss, and if they get two or three years imprisonment, which they could do, we won't be bothered with them for a while. And I think that's terrible. I mean, this is perhaps what any conventional uh, burglar would expect, but these are people in a so-called free society expressing a legitimate, honest point of view. And I think in the kind of society we say we've got, they should be allowed to do so. If the director of public prosecutions, a civil servant, decided that the film you've just seen was not in the public interest, he could prosecute the producer, the cameraman, the sound man, the lighting electrician, and me under the laws of conspiracy. That sounds absurd, doesn't it? But as I see it, the laws of conspiracy are so loose and all-embracing that it could happen. You see, these laws are a dragnet, a perfect weapon to use against critics of the prevailing order and political opposition. Shouldn't Parliament be more concerned with the fairness of a law under which a person can be found guilty of one crime without any proof that they've actually committed a crime? And is it not fundamental to our democratic system that politically contentious laws like conspiracy should be strictly defined by Parliament and not left to the mercy of policemen or civil servants to use as they wish. A great many lawyers are appalled by the use of the conspiracy laws, and the Law Commission has recommended the abolition of conspiracy to trespass because of, and I quote, its vagueness and unfairness. But the laws of conspiracy are still being used in this country and used to intimidate and silence all kinds of dissent. As I mentioned at the beginning, that's exactly how the system works in dictatorships. An example of how the system works in Britain was the use of the conspiracy laws only last week against Colin Dean, Peter Chappell and Geraldine Hughes, who have been charged with conspiracy to damage the Headingley test pitch as part of their campaign to free an imprisoned man they believe to be innocent. The conspiracy laws can in effect be used to invent new crimes. Indeed, the application of these laws is unlimited and they are, in my view, bad laws. As the cases in this documentary have shown, to be charged with conspiracy, you need not have committed any other crime. You need only have made an agreement, an unwritten, unbinding, even trivial agreement. It doesn't matter, because as the judge said, a nod and a wink can amount to conspiracy. The sting is not in what you agreed to do. The sting is in that word conspiracy. Of course, the official justification for the conspiracy laws is that they are necessary to catch those who plan big crimes but don't actually commit them the brains behind a bank robbery or a protection racket. Tom Harper of the New Law Journal will now present what he understands to be the official justification for the wider use of the conspiracy laws. Robbery and demanding money with menaces are, of course, examples of conduct which Parliament has expressly declared to be criminal offences. The courts, however, have held that even if conduct has never been declared to be a specific criminal offence by Parliament, its consequences may be so socially harmful when it is done by several people acting together that the courts should be able to deal with it. They have used the offence of conspiracy for that purpose. The case for this use of conspiracy can perhaps best be put in the words of Lord Hailsham, until recently Lord Chancellor. Statute law, 
the law made by Parliament, is, he said, notoriously easy to evade. The draftsman does his best, and the two Houses of Parliament conscientiously attempt to improve upon his labours. But in the end, it is the unpredictable, or at any rate the unpredicted, which always seems to happen. Parliament is at the disadvantage that it often hasn't the time to act when action is urgently needed to deal with the unforeseen, but the courts can act quickly in such circumstances through the law of conspiracy. However, the overriding issue in the administration of the law of conspiracy is whether the purpose of a particular getting together is socially harmful.